Indeed, and uh, uh, joining us now in the studio is uh, Leroy Logan, uh, former uh, senior police officer, um, mm -hmm. just uh, recently retired, and of course... Uh, two years. Two, uh, two years, mm -hmm. and uh, supporting uh, Sadiq Khan uh, in his bid to be the uh, London uh, Labour candidate for, uh, for Mayor. Welcome to the show, uh, Leroy. Okay, good to be here. Um, uh, first of all, just um, looking at the issue of affirmative action uh, and the police, because uh, uh, the question about uh, how to diversify the police has been around for uh, a very, very long time. Of course, so you were um, uh, formerly uh, a leading light in the uh, Black Police Association, which has been pushing uh, some of still these am, still issues. Am. Uh, still out, okay. Yeah, like uh, think just so, because yeah. you retire doesn't mean that you uh, you get yeah, out exactly. of the uh, first uh, the BPA. Stay on the executives. So. Okay, okay, well, uh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, we, ha we had, um, uh, you know, we've had a number of uh, BPA representatives. But let's actually get back to, uh, to the issue as well. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, Sadiq Khan taking uh, the issue further forward than the other uh, people have in the past? Well, I mean, I I've known Sadiq Khan uh, since when I was uh, chair of the London uh, Black Police Association. And also uh, I was the first national chair. So I, I know him from the late 90s, early O's. And um, we were making submissions to the Morris Inquiry in 2003 about uh, affirmative action, and, and, and Sadiq took an active role, and that's long before he became an MP in 2005. So I know he's got an understanding of what affirmative action is, and I believe he's got the vision and the drive and determination to make it happen, and holding the commissioner uh, to account to make sure that they have the supervision and leadership mm. to assist people, not but only of course to join, the, but to mm. stay. But in election campaigns, the candidates uh, from all parties typically say, we're going to hold the police to account. Mm. When they actually get into office, they say, we need to listen to what the commissioner has to say. Well, I think, again, because Sadiq was a civil rights lawyer, he knows how to challenge. Uh, he's got the depth of understanding, the knowledge, the experience and expertise to do that. And he's also surrounding himself with the right sort of people, like me, to do that. Um, and, and I think that's the important thing. And he's, you know, a very forensic lawyer. He, he goes into the detail. He doesn't rely on what he's being told. He makes sure he's got the right sort of questions to ask to ensure that um, people are held to account. And more importantly, to verify it's happening with the right p performance indicators, the right sort of review, and hopefully the right outcomes, not just outputs, but mm. outcomes. Thanks. So what's your role in, in his campaign? Are you just a supporter? Or I, I, I'm a supporter. Um, um, I spoke at the launch of his campaign uh, a few weeks ago in his um, home patch in Earlsfield in, in South West London. And uh, also I'm, I'm working with a team to do a youth event called Dare to Dream. So hashtag Dare to Dream. Um, it's on the 4th of August in uh, the South Bank, so if mm. you want to um, have a look at that, you can go on my Twitter account. What's that event about? It's basically giving young people an opportunity to discuss these issues that are impacting on them in London, mm. uh, not just policing, mm. but housing, transport, all these things that people want to know about. And of course, um, Sadiq will attend, but it's, it's mainly for the young people to discuss mm. these issues. I know that uh, Sadiq Khan has been taking selfies with young people and the, the hashtag uh, dare to dream. Mm. Uh, but uh, looking at um, the mayoral contest, uh, you're supporting uh, Sadiq, uh, obviously. Uh, what makes him uh, better uh, than Diane Abbott or uh, David Lammy, for example? I think from, from, from my concern, um, from my perspective even, he, he has shown a good track record as a councillor. He was a councillor for 13 years. Mm, in Wandsworth, yes. Uh, yeah, in Wandsworth. And then, of course, a civil rights lawyer. And he's still... Um, but Diane Abbott has a longer track record, doesn't she? Well, yeah. Because, because I'm, she, I'm, she goes I'm, back uh, centuries. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. But, but, but also, it's around what are the yeah. um, outcomes since um, Sadiq has been uh, Shadow London um, Minister for the Labour Party and where we saw... Um, a very, very significant labour um, result, positive results in London. And a lot of people say it's because of Sadiq's mobilising and galvanising people. And I've spoken to a couple of MPs who have said if it wasn't for Sadiq, they might not have been on the, um, on the list that, uh, or they might not have been selected at all. So, you know, he, he is someone who gets around. Um, I think he's got the dynamic nature. He's a fresh perspective, a new kid on the block, let's say, mm. and uh, I, for me, uh, knowing the man, knowing what he's done, um, he's his own person, 
It's got a vision. I, in fact, uh, I, I made a submission to the Fabian Society paper on Our London, edited by Sadiq. So that he was, that was like his manifesto, and that was in November um, 2013. So, you know, he has got, for me, a lot of the credentials to say, yep, I want to do this and this is how I want to do it. So does he, does he come to you for advice, obviously, uh, on the police, um, but does he ask you kind of, Obviously, he's a lawyer, he's detailed merchant, but does he ask you about the kind of anecdotal stuff? That, that yeah, he wants to know what's beyond the culture, what fuels the culture, you yeah. know. Why is that people will want to join, but they don't stay? You're mm. five to six times more likely to leave in the first couple of years if you're black than you're white. Mm. Have you I, got a, uh, sorry to cut you, have you got a, a view on that? Yeah, well, you know, he, he's taken my view, and that, and that is because the supervision and leadership especially at the lower ranks, is not there um, e echoing what's happening at management board. Because all the management board, the commissioner and his team, mm. talk the right sort of things. But does it filter down to the, to the supervision at the lower ranks? And to make sure that those offers from minority groups get the same exposure mm. and, 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 and expertise and opportunities been, to build a portfolio. But he hasn't been talking about that. Because when it is, uh, certainly the articles I've read, uh, have been talking about so, you know, increasing diversity in the police force, uh, racial diversity, which we'll all agree with, and talking about recruitment. But actually, when we're talking about retention and keeping them in and changing the culture, um, I haven't read anything about that. Or, you know, is that, are those policies being developed at the moment? They're being Developed. Yeah, so what would it include? I mean, what sort of things are needed in order to bring about that cultural change? So well, the black officers don't around, need. It's around yes. spotting the talent. Yes. It's around managing the talent to make sure you can give them the confidence to put themselves forward. Because that's the other thing. You know, there's a lot of corridor conversations. Oh, I don't think you're ready for the next um, promotion. Oh, why is that? Oh, you know, you need a bit more depth and breadth of experience. I had that as chief inspector yeah. going into superintendent was chair of the Black Police Association. And I had to tell that senior cop, to be quite honest, just this conversation, I could take you to employment tribunal. Yeah. But a lot of people don't have that um, confidence to do that. And more importantly, um, it might knock them back. Fortunately, I went for superintendent and the rest is history. So that's the, those sort of nuances of the culture really need to be addressed to ensure that if a supervisor stops someone from um, putting themselves forward, they'll be held to a task, you know, held to account. So you have to do a proper health check of all the, the boroughs and all the units to ensure that black um, personnel are going through the ranks and not being held back. What do you think um, would be um, an ideal future state? Because obviously there is a need for a black police association. You know, you're still part of that organisational body. So as a, a police officer that served for 30 years and rose up high, very high in the ranks, um, do you feel now that you've left, a, I always do these two prong questions, do you, did you feel by the time you left, this is going to sound like a stupid question, but more of a police officer or when you're in that situation, do you feel like more of a police officer or like more of a black man? And, and, and that's I think it's a very really good question because I had to make sure, yeah. even before I joined, I said I'm a black man who happens to be a cop. Right. Because here I am at the other end of the 30 years, I'm still a black man. Mm. So that puts it clearly in your mind, what do you stand for? Mm. And, you know, I, I'll work with a team, I'll do my best um, to ensure that we do the best for, the, for Londoners. Mm. But I'll make sure I'm not falling into misplaced loyalties, I'm not going to conform to the norms and values of the organisation if it means that I lose my principles and I, form, I start to assimilate. I'm going to make sure that I bring my expertise and experience to enrich the culture, and that's mm. what the culture should do. It doesn't celebrate diversity, and unfortunately, it doesn't allow people to have, feel confident to express themselves mm. from their c cultural perspective. Absolutely. Uh, Lee we'll definitely be keeping a close eye on the London campaign. Unfortunately, we've uh, spent far too long reviewing the papers <laughs> before, oh, okay. uh, before you arrived and getting into uh, Calais and, uh, and Cecil the Lion. So, uh, so we have to, uh, to say goodbye to you. Well, I don't mind being a victim of Cecil the Lion. I'm happy to get you back on my new show, which is going to be all about the police. And Absolutely. Yeah, we'll be talking about um, uh, yeah. Alex's new show uh, just uh, just before we, uh, we we sign off as well. So we're going to take a, a short break and we'll be back uh, talking uh, uh, with the uh, historian uh, Martin Hoyles about um, some historical black historical characters in Britain that you may not have necessarily heard about. So uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll be back uh, right after uh, these messages. Matter most. World Remit works with you. We enable you to instantly send money to Africa when they need it worldremit.com download
Breakfast, Breakfast Show. Show. Lifestyle, Lifestyle on Ben Television, Television Sky 182. 182. Every Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We give you all the information relating to entertainment and up-to-date news from the Caribbean. Presented by Pam Joseph. Ben Television, Television Bridging, Bridging the Gap. The Gap. Of the confusion that we have in Lagos is also the political situation and on politics with KO what we try and do is to go beyond the confusion and get something really meaningful. Welcome back to the Big Ben Show with me, Lester Holloway and um, Alex Watson. And uh, thanks very much to uh, uh, Leroy Logan, senior policeman and uh, spokesman, it seems, for uh, Sadiq Khan uh, for coming uh, into the show. Uh, now, um, I asked just before the, uh, uh, the break, uh, who is uh, Otaba uh, Kuguano? Uh, who is uh, William uh, Cuffe? Uh, you may not know unless you are definitely a student of uh, black British uh, history, but uh, someone who uh, is here to tell us is uh, someone who's uh, written uh, books uh, about uh, those uh, two characters and uh, uh, and much more besides uh, Martin Hoyles. Uh, welcome to the show, Martin. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, <laughs> now is it uh, your mission to uh, dig out the black historical characters that are not so much talked about? Because you know we know, or you know, we've got, got growing awareness in Black History Month in schools about you know the likes of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 you know uh, Equiano and so on, but um, we don't hear much about the characters that you you write books about. Well, there are certain characters that are still are not very well known, that's why. I mean, if you take Kagono, uh, I don't think anybody's heard of him, really. Well, just reference who that is, that's, um, can you, sh it's, um, K can you explain to us who Kago, there's the book. Yeah. Kaguano. Kaguano, yes. Yeah. Was one of the uh, campaigners against the slave trade in the 18th century, and he was, uh, originally a slave himself. He was kidnapped from Africa uh, in present-day Ghana. Take, uh, as he was old, uh, only 13 years old then, and taken to the West Indies and was a slave there for several years before he was brought to England. And uh, here he somehow became free and became a servant to a couple of artists. And that's when he got involved in the campaign against the slave trade. Mm. And he eventually wrote a book which uh, argued against it. Mm. But what was interesting about him, unlike uh, Equiano, he was against slavery itself as well, not just the slave trade. And mm. so he was ahead of his time there, you know, ahead of even people like Wilberforce. Wilberforce is the only person people know really about uh, the campaign against the slave trade. But he wasn't against slavery. He thought it was okay for the time being because they weren't civilized enough to be free. 
Mm. So it's, it's partly in the book I'm trying to debunk Wilberforce yeah. as well as put forward other people who are more important. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Before we talk about, uh, you know, uh, William Cofe, uh, what's really sparked your, um, your interest? I mean, have you always, you know, been interested in, uh, in, in uh, Black British history or the, uh, the slave trade? I think the first time I got interested was reading Peter Fryer's book, Staying Power, The History of Black People in Britain. Mm. And that opened my eyes to all the people that hadn't been heard of before. Mm. And how certainly old, how not old were you then, roughly? Uh, I should think in my 20s. Okay, then. yes. Yeah, so it was some time ago. And then since I got married uh, to my wife, Asha, I got even more interested in black history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started off doing a book called Remember Me, which was achievements of mixed race people, past and present. And we wrote that for our daughter, Rosa, in particular. But that revealed a whole heap of people that had not been uh, talked about before, going right back to Robert Wedderburn 200 yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the way we got into it. And since then we've done quite a lot of research on um, black history with my wife, particularly to do with dyslexia and uh, performance poetry. And uh, it's gone on from there, really. Can't stop. <laughs> so how did you come across the character Coguano? Um, and how did you go about researching and um, pu pulling the book together because like you said um, one of the things that you mentioned early on in the book is that we do know about William Wilberforce and he's kind of um, attributed with as the kind of person that ended the slave trade and we don't often hear much about other characters or about the um, abolitionist movement or the uprisings that continually happened during slavery that contributed to the end of the actual practice. Um, but w where did you go about finding the, the information? Um, well, I, I go to the British Library regularly and do a lot of research there. Yeah. And what was interesting was that the campaign against the slave trade was a massive campaign in this country. Hundreds of thousands of people were involved in it. And all we hear about is Wilberforce, mm. which is nonsense. I mean, women were involved. They had a sugar boycott to try and stop people, you know, okay. drinking tea with sugar from the West Indies in it. And Wilberforce actually opposed that. He said women aren't, aren't meant to be involved in politics. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of redressing the balance of history, really. Mm -hmm. and of course, uh, famously, uh, William Wilberforce wouldn't let black people into his house as well. Exactly. That, that's, that's certainly what, uh, you know, what I've heard and read anyway. Uh, no, I've got the evidence the in the you, book. You have evidence in the yes, book. Okay, yes, cool, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give the book a little bit of a plug um, yeah. uh, shortly. Yeah. Uh, of course, so we've got um, uh, a march against uh, or in favour of reparations, which is happening uh, this Saturday. It's, uh, it's happening at 11am uh, at uh, Windrush Square in Brixton, and they're marching to Parliament. Of course, last year there were around 7,000 people that took place uh, in the march. Uh, that was the, the organisers' estimates. I think the police said about three or 4,000, but uh, there's always <laughs> a difference between police, police estimates figures, and uh, the actual number of uh, feet on, on the streets, uh, so to speak. But, uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, the, the issue of, of enslavement uh, br brings um, us al almost inexorably to, to the issue of uh, what uh, happens as a result of it. Uh, of course, we had the uh, documentary, uh, just a two-part documentary by uh, David mm -hmm. Olasaga, yeah. which we've been discussing extensively uh, on this uh, show. Uh, but uh, you know, do you think that uh, knowing more about uh, you know, the, the likes of Otaba uh, Kogwano will actually um, uh, sort of, you know, feed into um, you know, as a sort of logical conclusion, talking about um, not just uh, enslavement, but reparations as well? Yes, I, I do think so. And I think definitely it should be on the agenda. I was asked this recently at uh, another talk I gave, and somebody wanted to look into their own ancestry and see who was involved in it and so on. And in the programme you mentioned, there's a lot of evidence of who received the money, the £20 million pounds that was paid out in 1834, was it mm. for 1835, mm. went to all the slave owners. And they were all around this country, exactly. all over the place. Widows, churches, ministers, everybody. And people in the Caribbean as well got, um, um, you know, compensated. <clears throat> but that, that's not here on the, on the table today, but another one that I read that you wrote was about um, somebody called Ira Aldridge, who was an actor, a um, kind of Shakespearean actor, an, a kind of all-round actor. And from the book, I really got the impression that he was kind of you know, Samuel L. Jackson, Denzel, like, like a, a brilliant... All rolled into one. Yeah, I got the impression that he was... He was the most celebrated actor in the whole of Europe in the 19th century, Ira Aldridge. Mm. And so many people still haven't heard of him. I mean, he came from New York when he was aged 17 and got a part playing Othello almost straight away in an East London theatre. 
And he, he toured the whole of Europe. He went to Russia, mm -hmm. to Germany, Poland and so on. In fact, he was buried in the end in Poland where yeah. he died on tour. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I read in that book was that after a lot of his performances, he often would kind of give a speech, an anti-slavery yeah. speech. So he was a very strong activist and advocate and he was well respected and well renowned for it. Exactly. And he sent money back to the States as well to help. Yeah, slaves. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, another book as well, which I'll just uh, hold up here, giving a big a book <laughs> plug, if we can get the Thank camera on it. Much. Um, no, we haven't got the camera on it, um, is, uh, is William uh, Cuffey, who's a Chartist uh, leader. Uh, now, uh, there we go, if we get that. Um, now, um, the Chartists, of course, w um, w were contributed to the, the Magna Carta, I, b I believe. And uh, maybe I've got this wrong, so I'm sure yes, you're correct me as a... Not much earlier, the 800th anniversary of, uh, of, of the Magna Carta. Mm. I'm sure you'll correct me on that point. But uh, William <laughs> yeah. Cafe was uh, a very prominent um, Chartist. So tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, about him. The Chartist movement again is neglected. Mm. I mean, of course, it's a working class movement yeah. that was the biggest political movement ever seen in this country and was campaigning for rights to vote, basically, and for uh, MPs to be paid so they didn't have to be rich people. All those kind of things were going on in the 19th century. There was a lot of trade, un trade unionism, activism as well, wasn't there? Yes, to, yeah, to yeah, trade well, unions. Better before conditions. The trade unions were, were formed, surely? No, no, they were formed. I mean, Cafe was a member of the Tailors Union, and they, he was on strike in 1834, a strike which failed, and after that he couldn't get any work because of that, and that's when he joined the Chartists, campaigning for more civil rights. Okay. But what's interesting about him is uh, his grandfather was an enslaved African, his father was a slave in St. Kitts, and uh, mm -hmm. he eventually got freed and came and settled in Chatham, okay. where William Cuffey was born. Definitely. Uh, time is uh, unfortunately uh, against <laughs> us. Uh, it is. It's uh, flown by oh uh, like, uh, uh, like nobody's business. Uh, it's like an arrow, literally, time has flown by. Uh, just a quick plug, um, Martin Hoyles, you can find uh, all your books and, on Hansib, published by Hansib, so uh, just uh, uh, go and look that up, and uh, definitely uh, worth the read. Um, definitely. Now, um, Alex, uh, this is your last show. You're uh, about oh, to uh, yeah. uh, leave me and uh, form your, your own uh, show, which is um, broadcasting tomorrow. So yes. uh, just uh, uh, one more, just very briefly, uh, to tell us about it. Yeah, um, it's a show, I, I don't, don't think I want to reveal the name of the show just quite yet. I'm kind okay. of doing it's, it a bit under the radar. It's a secret at the moment. <laughs> it's a secret, yeah, but it is about um, law enforcement, about the police, about um, community relations, and we will be having guests on and, you know, um, probably developing and evolving the format um, um, as we see how it goes, but we're, there's going to be definitely a, a large element of having the police in to talk to us, to talk to us all, and hopefully this will um, engender some some positive dialogue, but also get under the skin of some of the issues that have um, that, okay. that are there. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been, been an absolute pleasure. It's been a great working you, with you uh, as well on, on the show. Uh, I will be back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as always, uh, next Thursday at uh, 1 o'clock, so uh, tune in then for, for much more uh, discussion, uh, guests and much, much more. So uh, have a fantastic day and I will see you next week.